Welcome everyone to the first summary lecture um, for LGBTQ plus politics, a comparative course in policy related to lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, and queer, and others, um, and the policies related to them. This first set of readings uh, is basically related to the background, historical background. There's more information uh, on the websites provided in the syllabus, but um, I'm going to hit the very high points on that in the first slide, and then we'll move on to public opinion readings. We begin with a discussion of the Mattachine Society, which is the first established gay rights community organization or movement in the United States and begins in the 1950s. And this begins partially in response to the heating up of the Red Scare. If you're not familiar with that period, it's a period in the 50s where um, government officials tried to identify and purge the communists from government and high-ranking positions. And this, um, there was an association made falsely or correctly, we're not sure, between communists and homosexuals. And so communists um, were seen as untrustworthy as were homosexuals, and both of these groups sort of uh, became targeted in this time period. So this followed um, with a pattern that already existed uh, of criminalization of homosexual acts and the really poor treatment, medical treatments, um, mental health treatments, things ranging from lobotomies to electroshock therapy to chemical castration that occurred. Um, so uh, the, really throughout um, American history related to homosexual behavior. Uh, so the, the movement was really kind of radical in its very beginnings, just kind of challenging the common wisdom related to homosexuality. The 70s, really the 60s and the 70s, uh, along with the other liberation movements, Women's Lib and the Civil Rights Movement, did provide more impetus for the gay rights liberation movement. And um, they meet with significant opposition beginning really in the 1980s, where the religious right begins a campaign against feminism, against homosexuality, and against abortion. And they begin to align with the Republican Republican Party at this time and really begin to sort of influence the the platform of the, the Republican Party to include sort of anti-gay stances. And beginning, especially in the 1990s, we had one of our reading points of this out, um, that this becomes a central issue in most elections. The public opinion readings do offer some interesting insight, especially when you take them in the context of time. Um, so you see that since um, the really advent of homosexuality as a major social and political issue starting in, say, the 1980s. Um, this also represents, by the way, the time period when the most consistent questions begin to be asked in the national surveys. Um, so it makes a good data point, but it also is politically important because you begin to ask those questions in surveys because it is detected as an important political issue. And so this very first figure shows us really the evolution of public opinion um, related to just the general feelings of um, toward lesbians and gay men. Opinions related to the legality of same-sex relations is also really interesting to look at. And there is a little bit more context added to this figure because we see the increase in those who want same-sex relations legalized and the decrease in those who believe that it should be criminalized. Also, just a brief note, this is uh, pointed out in your timeline, but same-sex relations um, are not... Um, legal throughout all 50 states until 2003, where um, the uh, Bowers versus Hardwick decision is overturned by the Supreme Court, and all laws regarding uh, homosexual sexuality um, are deemed unconstitutional. A couple of authors point to the 
simultaneous dip that happens in 2003 and support and how that coincides with the Supreme Court decision that decriminalizes homosexual sex acts. A very similar story plays out when we look at support for adoption rights for same-sex couples. By the way, adoption rights would include the ability for a second parent of the same sex to adopt a biological child of the first parent, but it also applies to adoption rights for a non-biological child of both gay, both people in a gay couple. So this is kind of an interesting legal question. Support for marriage equality has actually been the most dramatic in the 2000s. Uh, you see a really dramatic rise of those in favor, a really dramatic drop of those opposed. There are a couple of different discussions about this, uh, why this takes place um, in, the, in all of these articles, um, that, but I think all have potential. The previous slides have come from this article titled National Trends in Public Opinion on LGBT Rights in the United States. Flores is the author of this. He's used 325 national surveys um, over the time period from 1977 to 2014. Um, by the way, normally this would come before I show you the graphs, but the graphs you've been looking at are from Flores' study. And his general um, summary is that public support has doubled over three decades. This is actually really um, significant because in the same time period, feelings towards other types of minorities have actually become colder, have become less supportive, whether you're talking about communists, uh, liberals, conservatives, or um, Muslims, feminists. There's a negative a decrease in support for these issues. So this is really, really significant. So why has this happened? One of the interesting things about public opinion research is that it doesn't just report your feeling thermometer um, and the percentage of people who feel a certain way or support versus not supporting an issue. They actually try to find some explanations for that. And some of the socialization literature on why people vote the way they do, period, is relevant here. And one of those, um, or actually there are basically three separate explanations surrounding the, the question of age and how age impacts uh, how you vote. So age effects essentially say that it's the variation of where you are chronologically that matters. Um, there are biological things associated with being certain ages that might influence your decisions, um, your social experience that are related to living more decades or fewer decades than other people. And these are the things that sort of shape our opinions. So by this kind of logic, generational effects will be noticed. You'll see that older people uh, tend to not support gay rights, whereas younger people who are more uh, open-minded and, and more modern might be more willing to accept um, an expansion of rights. Um, an alternate explanation is period effects. The idea that it's variation over time that affects all age groups, not necessarily how old you are at a certain period, but that change in society that's taking place um, can have an effect on people regardless of their age. And um, a third explanation is the cohort effect that says that different formative experiences happen to different generations based on where they are at a certain time period. So the millennial effect, for example, uh, people who grow up in a certain era are exposed to certain things just as millennials. So the idea that as a cohort, these people will have their ideas shaped differently. And so looking over time gives you a more perspective on why this happens. And so that's why it's very important that this public opinion research has taken such a long view. And they 
find that period effects are more strongly influential. So it is the changes that are happening to all of us that matter and not so much age effects. This is very significant because this means that we don't have to wait for conservative, religious, or just old uninformed people to die out. They're actually capable of change and capable of conceiving of the expansion of these rights as well. I encourage you to read more in detail than I'm summarizing here uh, because there's more context provided within the readings I'm absolutely summarizing. But some additional considerations that do um, emerge from the set of readings on public opinion include this theme that um, knowing an LGBTQ person, if you're a cisgender straight person, that actually increases your tendency to support LGBTQ rights. And um, so this is the logic behind the contact hypothesis. So there's a lot of literature out there that indicates that as the movement around LGBTQ rights has grown and awareness about these issues has grown, people have felt more comfortable coming out and have been more activists in their daily lives, which has led to more people knowing people who are queer, essentially. By the way, queer is a term that is accepted among a lot of LGBT scholars as a, an umbrella term for the LGBTQ plus community. So uh, from familiarity with LGBTQ persons, the contact hypothesis, knowing someone who is LGBTQ, also ties into urbanization. The more population density you're experiencing as a whole, the more likely that society in general will become more tolerant of difference in general. So LGBTQ persons have generally made more advances as far as local government ordinances and in general rights protected um, in these high density cities. And there's another set of academic questions related to our institutions. Um, our institutions at times are criticized for not responding to public opinion. There is a lot of literature out there that indicates that maybe sometimes they don't at the highest levels respond to public opinion in the way that they should. So the question ha becomes, and there's probably evidence on both sides, I would say, that legislator legislatures make laws that protect people and that could impact support for pub for LGBTQ policies, but also the change in LGBTQ plus opinion um, has maybe changed who gets voted in. So I do think that is a relevant conversation to have. And the same kind of question relates to how court decisions change public opinion or if courts are actually responding to public opinion. And there is some information and literature on that for us to discuss in the coming days. I also think it's interesting if we think about this in the comparative context of what good is public opinion if the democratic institutions do not function or if you're in a non-democratic country. So are the institutions in places like the Middle East where you know there is not um, a, the type of liberal democracy that we experience in, mo in most cases, is then the public opinion responding to the institutional force or are institutions simply completely divorced from this process and people are making up their own minds and they're still opposed to it. In cases where public opinion increases for gay rights and you're not in a democracy, do those institutions change? These are all relevant questions when we look around the world. So um, also how does vote choice um, matter? How is it impacted by your opinion on LGBTQ plus policy? This matters for people who are LGBTQ plus voters, but it also matters for people who are um, heterosexual and cisgendered. Uh, if this is an important issue to them, if they're important um, or they find it important that they be allies to this cause, is it impacting their votes? Um, and so this is an interesting consideration going forward and there's a lot of potential for research related to the question uh, of these interplays between institutions and public opinion on this um, 
pretty revolutionary concept of lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgender, queer people advancing their rights in society.